We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High Life, we advance. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to go straight into scriptures and then we pray and then we'll just share a few thoughts and then we'll come back to pray again. I'd like us to go to Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 to 2. And then we'll go to 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 1 to 14. Let me start with 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter, tw- chapter 2 from verse 1 to 14. 2 Kings chapter 2. From verse 1 to 14. It says, and it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me unto Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elisha, Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho also came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. As the, but he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. The next verse. Then it happened as they talked on, and as they continued and talked on, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Next verse. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. Next verse. We are going to verse 14. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word that gives life. We thank you for your word that gives inspiration. We thank you for your word that gives direction. We thank you for your word that confirms the thoughts of our hearts, that shapes our destiny and calls us into a higher place, O God. We ask, O God, as we hear your word this morning, cause a change to happen from the inside of us in the name of Jesus. 
Open unto us, O God, the, o God, the portals of reality. Let us come to lay hold on truth. Not just the truth in the head, but the truth that we can experience and live out, O God, to cause a change in our communities, in our societies, and in our families in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask for unction. I ask for, for, for grace, O God, to speak your word accurately in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that everyone that hears, including myself, O God, that we will not be forgetful hearers, but we will be those who hear and do, and Lord, would reap. 30, 60, and 100 fold. In Jesus' much less name we pray. Praise the Lord. I've titled my message this morning, Ancient Plans and Living Sacrifices. Ancient Plans and Living Sacrifices. Now, when, when, when we got born again, many things happened. Um, for some of us, we know that we came into a new family. The Bible says in, in Colossians that... He delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay, but within that context of being born again, sometimes it's easy to think that, you know, what happened was I was a sinner and then now I'm a child of God, but my life can just go on as it is. The only difference now is that whereas if, 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 if somebody, you know, insulted me in the past, I could easily say God punish you. But now I can say, God bless you. Okay, so that's, that's all that changed, you know. But it's, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. When we got born again, there were translations, there were transfers, and there were changes, deep changes. In fact, when you got born again, when the Bible says that if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away. What it means is that the type of human being that you were before, is not the type that you are now. As a child of God, you are a new species of being. Okay? You are, you are different. You are so remarkably different that, that your DNA, everything about you has changed. Okay? You may not see it yet in the natural, but in the spirit, there is a deep change that has happened in you. And one of those changes is that you have entered a new kingdom. And that kingdom has an agenda. Okay? And the key thing is this, that you know, sometimes when we get born again, you think that you made a personal decision. You know, I don't know how you got born again. Maybe a pastor preached and then he said, come forward if you want to receive Jesus into your heart. So at that point, you think that you intellectually surmised everything that the pastor had said. And he said, this looks like, you know, a good thing for me to do. Let me join. And so you think you chose. But the Bible says that he chose you. Okay, what you are doing is only a res response to his choice. And that, but, but the thing is that your, even your coming into the kingdom is beyond you. There's a whole agenda, there's a whole purpose, there's a whole plan that has been laid by God even before he formed the world. That your coming into the kingdom activates. And if we don't see that plan, if we don't see that agenda, if we don't see that, that purpose, it's easy or I dare say that is the reason why many of us, you know, when we get born again, we just say a few words and then we just continue the ownership of our lives. Even though in the realm of the spirit, we know that ownership has changed. But in our experience, we still live as though we don't have a new owner. It's because we don't have an understanding of that agenda, that purpose. So when you read Romans chapter 12, many times... You know, one way I like to read the Bible, I, I don't like, when I'm doing my personal study, I like to read a book from beginning to end at once, okay? And the reason for that is because sometimes reading it, chapters, maybe you read chapter one today in Romans, then go to Galatians chapter three tomorrow. You know those books were letters, right? Yeah? You know they were letters. How many of you, I know these days people don't write letters so much. But, but back in the day when we were in secondary school, even though our parents told us, go to school and read your books. But somehow, you know, in just one, I was in, I was school in the north, the federal school in the north. And then we come on holiday, I said, you know, Father, help us. As young as we were then, JS1, JS2, how old were we? But we started, we started liking girls already. Okay? So when we come during that holiday period, okay, you see one babe in church during holiday. So you get her. We didn't have email then. This was in the 90s. Okay, so at least not in Nigeria. So you get her postal address. And then when you go back, and she goes back to another school, maybe somewhere in Oshobo, wherever, 
Okay, you do what? You write what? A letter. How many of you in your letters that you wrote or received, your letter was in chapter and verse? It wasn't. It wasn't. There's, the only people that write letter in paragraph from paragraph to are Nigerian civil servants. Okay, <laughs> the only people that write letters like that, they number it. Okay, but normally when you write a letter, especially when you're writing a letter of love, and you know that the Bible is God's love letter to you, the, in the original there was no chapter and verse. It was just one letter, but it was for ease of understanding. Okay, that translators began to put chapter and verse. So I like to read the the the, the Bible. When I'm studying it, maybe not at one sitting, but I'm reading it to get the full picture of what he's saying. Do you understand? So when, when we read Romans chapter 12, verse 1, can you hear me put it back on the screen, sir? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it talks about, it says, I beseech you therefore. That therefore is there for a reason. Okay? It's talking about things that have happened in the previous verses. Now, I, I believe that even though some people believe that Ephesians is the height of Paul's um, apostolic writings. But you see, I, I love Romans because Romans shows us some of the things that we just, you know, when you get born again, you just, you just responded to a simple message. You didn't even know what you entered. Okay? It's, it's like using a phone. When you buy this phone, whatever it is, you're using Samsung, iPhone, whatever. Okay? The, basically, you just bought it to send text, receive calls, and browse. And then if you're a grandmother, send forward all sorts of messages on WhatsApp. Okay? You know? But as you... So that's for just a basic user, right? But there are people who can take this phone and connect it to their TV. And some of you, most of you, there's some people that live in Lucky Phase 1. I'm looking at them. They're wearing yellow on this side. Their phones can do that, but they don't know how to use it. <laughs> because their business is just to do what? Call, text, and forward message on WhatsApp. Okay? So when you got born again, what you really, you just heard, Jesus will save me from my sins. Thank you, Jesus. I'm in heaven now. Glory to God. But there are, deep, there are deeper truths that as you enter, it begins to get revealed. And, and for me, that's what Romans is about. Romans begins to show us that when we came to Christ, actually, it shows that it didn't start with us. It started with Adam. That there was a plan that God had for humanity. So this thing is bigger than you just coming out on a Sunday to say, I believe. Okay? It says that there was a plan that started from, from, with God, you know, at the beginning with Adam. That was chapter 2, you know. With, and then it talks about how Adam fell in chapter 3, chapter, um, chapter 4. How Adam fell, you know, and then how Adam he was the first man and then God sent... Christ, you know, to restore all the things that Adam lost. And then we see how we should respond to that, the implications for us in terms of our work with God and everything. And then we get to chapter 9, where, no, chapter 8, where Paul begins to talk about the expectation of creation, how creation is waiting for the sons of God to manifest. Okay? And then we get to chapter 9, where he begins to talk about Israel. And begins to show us the link. That the reason why we have a chance... It's because of Abraham in chapter 4, first of all, that God said he will bless the whole of humanity through Abraham. But chapter 9, is, he then begins to tell us that the reason why Israel seems to be out of order, not included now, is that so that we can have a chance. You know, you know that's chapter 9. Then he, he builds that thought up to chapter 11. Okay? And if you look at um, chapter 11, maybe from verse 25, he begins to talk, tell us about how, you know, Israel was the original branch that was pulled away, and then we were grafted in. And that if the pulling away of Israel leads to us being grafted in, how much more their own grafting in? So, it shows us a plan. Okay? That this thing didn't start with you. It started with Abraham, all of those things that Moses was doing in the mountain. That's where it's coming from. And then, that's where we get to chapter 12. Where now says, because of all these things I've said, therefore, present your bodies. Do, 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 you, do, do you understand? It's that, that there's a plan. There's something that's been coming. It didn't just start with you saying, I believe. And then you filled out the form. No, it says that you, you were plugged into a plan. A plan that has been on from even before the world started. And that plan is what is defining your life today. It's defining how God chose you, when he chose you. The stirrings in your spirit. It's about that plan. 
And this, that, that's, that's why I called it ancient plans. A, a few of those agendas that we see clearly in, in Scripture, we can see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, you know, Paul giving us an idea of part of God's plan. And one of the things he said is that, he said, for it pleased the Father that in him, that is in Christ, all the fullness should dwell, verse 20. It says, and by him, that's by Christ, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So, so part of the plan of God, okay, part of why he chose you in him before the foundation of the world is to reconcile all things. Notice, he didn't say all people. Do you understand? So people is just a part of it. So there's a dimension of the gospel. There's a time we will start preaching to things. Because when Adam fell, it wasn't just humanity that lost its place. Even things, animals, inanimate objects, they lost their purpose. That's why the Bible says that even the creation, it didn't say human beings in Romans 8, even the creation is groaning, waiting for us to manifest. The systems of the world, concepts like work, concepts like entertainment, concepts like relaxation, concepts like business, they'll be reconciled to Christ. Concepts like politics, governance, families, culture, all things. So that's part of God's plan. Part of God's agenda is to reconcile all things to himself. Thrones, things that are, if you go back to, if you go to earlier verses, it talks about, it tries to describe all things. It talks about, it says, it says the things in heaven and on earth, the things that are seen, thrones, powers, principalities, all things are being reconciled. That's, that's, what, you are, that's what you are into. That's the thing that Paul saw when he said, Therefore, the other thing, quickly, is that part of God's agenda is that he wants to display his wisdom to principalities and powers through the church. Think about that. He wants to display his wisdom. He wants the church to be an expression of his wisdom. But he's not doing it, it's not as if he's telling the church to express this wisdom to other human beings. No. No. The wisdom that you and I are meant to walk in as part of God's agenda is to showcase God's wisdom to spirit beings in heavenly places. So we have left the dimension of wisdom that we are competing with Google and Oracle. No. Okay? It's higher than that. And yes, you know that in the expression of the church today, we have not even started competing with the natural realm. Because we have not laid hold on reality like that yet. Okay? You, you, you'd find that in Ephesians 3, verse 9 to 11. And it, it begins to lend credence to the fact that any wisdom you see displayed on earth has its source in heaven. I don't have the time to go to Genesis chapter 4. You know, when Cain, Genesis chapter 3, when Cain had kid Abel, okay? And then after that, we see that the first person that built a city was Cain. And you know that he, he didn't build this. You see, because God's original design was for man to fulfill his purpose, being powered by the presence of God. That's why he puts him in a garden. Okay? That from, from, from communion with God, he could then go and, you know, do things. Plant vineyards and do all of these other things. But when, when, when man fell, okay, the devil subtly came in I began to teach man. There are books, there are other historical books that have been written. And if you look at chapter 4, I think, or chapter 5, I can't remember now. It, 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 talks about, it talks about how, you know, the sons of God, quote and unquote, these were fallen angels who came to man to begin to teach men, you know, secrets from the spirit dimension. And the Bible says that those men and those, those sons of God, those fallen angels slept with women, okay? And then they produced giants in the earth. And I said that those giants were men of renown. Those are people that did great things. How did they do the great things? They were able to connect with wisdom that came from another plane. Now, God is saying that in this time, okay, the, he's going to use the church to teach wisdom to the people that are teaching wisdom to the world. I don't know if you got what I'm saying. Yeah? So that, that's your purpose. So let, 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 let's go back to, to Ephesians 3, verse 9. It says, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ. Verse 10. So the intent that when, when, now, not in the future, now, 
the manifold, that is the many-sided wisdom. So it's not just a wisdom of church. It's a wisdom of technology, a wisdom of business, a wisdom of, of, of science, okay? That the many-sided wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So your competition is not men anymore. Your competition is angels. You understand? To teach them. That, that's what we have been called to. That's the agenda. And so we see that Paul, understanding this background, begins to state some things. When he says in, 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 in 2 Timothy, for instance, chapter 1, you know, talking about how he understood. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, talking about how he understood that we, we, have been, that we were called in, even before the foundation of the earth. Okay, he said, who saved us and called over the holy calling? According to his purpose and grace. See that word purpose. That's the agenda we're talking about. Which was given to us in Christ. When? Before time began. Verse 10. It said, but has now been revealed by the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Verse 11. It says, to which I. Now, now, this is. Verse 9 was the general plan. Verse 11 shows his own part of it. It says that I have been what appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. So you know that the reason why Israel seems to be blind today is because of the Gentiles, right? And Paul says that I was appointed to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. There's something that because of the grand plan of God from before now, there's something you have been appointed for. There's something that you have been designed to bring to the table to advance the agenda of the kingdom. And that thing didn't start today. It has been planned before you, before your father met your mother. Before your grandfather met your grandmother or grandmothers, as the case may be. It, 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 has, been, it has been put in place. So that, 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 that shows us that God has a plan. That didn't start from now. And, and, and I believe by prophetic understanding and so, some, also some direction that, that, I've, that I've, I mean, I've listened to some, 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 some people who I believe understand the time and the seasons. And they've said that in this season, God is raising an Elisha generation. An Elisha generation. A people who would build on what Elijah started, but then take it to a different dimension. If you look at the ministry of Elijah, Elijah's, Elijah's ministry was more if I want to use it in today's language, it was more centered around the church. So it was for reformation, calling the church back to worship of God because the church had been, you know, had been plagued by idol worship and all of that. It was calling them back, you know, to, to, to the, for the worship of the true God. Now, when Elisha came, Elisha took that anointing on Elijah, okay, because the, the anointing on Elijah was so powerful. Even Elisha alone couldn't carry it. But God told Elijah, he said, look, look for three people. Jehu, Hazael and Elisha, and anoint them, okay? And it tells you that sometimes the anointing, you can be following someone who maybe is calling it to be a prophet, okay? But that, the anointing on that person, when it's imparted on you, it can express as wisdom in the marketplace, okay? So, so we see that while Elijah's, while, while Elijah's expression was more for church life, Okay, restoring foundations. Elisha's expression was more to the spheres of society. Do you understand that? Taking this thing we are seeing in church, this is your speaker. How do you know that in your office, if there's a problem, you're speaking in tongues there. Well, no, in fact, they can even sack you for that. It will impress them. It may impress us in church. Ah, that guy is praying for six hours. Let's make him a deacon. Okay? But there, it has no value. What has value is that speaking in tongues, eh? How you can convert it to a language that they understand. So that, that's, the, that's the Elisha generation. So when we see Elisha, you know, healing the waters, um, when, when they, they, they brought the waters, they said this city is a good city, but the waters are bad. You see him operating at the level of fixing nations and fixing cities. Okay, he took that anointing and applied it there. When we see Elisha, there was a woman who didn't have a child. The Bible says that she, her husband was old, 
What Elisha did, he prophesied and she had a child. He was fixing the institution of family. When we see a situation where the nation was down, the economy was bad, people were eating their own children. And Elisha came and spoke a word. And within 24 hours, the economy upturned. You see Elisha operating at the economic and business fair. Okay? When you see Elisha, you know, when the sons of the prophets came to him and they said, we want to build a larger place. We see that Elisha was actually involved in raising new prophetic models. He was raising the next generation. That is the, 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 the mountain of education. He, 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 he invested the anointing that he had in building new models for education. When, when you see that, when the, when the sons of the prophets, when they got to the water and their axe fell into the water and Elisha with a prophetic word, he cursed and, and, and I mean, he used a technology, he put wood inside and the water flowed up. That's, that's what, that's the realm of technology. When, 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 when people, you know, they gathered together and they wanted to eat and they said that the food was not enough. Okay. And Elisha through, through his prophetic anointing, he multiplied the food. That's agriculture. He was, he was involved in these different spheres. And that's the, that's the dimension. That God is calling us to. Because the world may not hear the name Jesus. They may, they may not like it. But when you come to an organization that is about to sink, and you come up with a revolutionary idea that springs that organization from, from loss to, to, to increase profit, they will listen to you. That, that's what happened in Genesis. When, when Joseph came and he brought the idea, Pharaoh said, how can we find someone in whom is the spirit of the living God? Joseph didn't speak in tongues. He gave them solution. Okay? And that solution didn't come from Harvard. Though. So this, this type of dimension I'm talking about, is, you, you don't study it in a school. You understand? There is, there is a level of, there is a wisdom in the spirit that is useful for more than calling your phone number. Do you understand? Because we see a lot of Prophets in Nigeria, you cannot tell us where Leah Sharibu is. And you can't call. What is the use? Do you understand? You can't locate her by your spiritual GPS. Elisha did that. He, he could, he could, he could, he could foresee. First of all, Elisha anointed Jehu as king. So he operated in the political sphere. He anointed Hazael as king. He operated in the political sphere. When enemies were coming against Israel, what did he do? He could, through prophetic intelligence, he could tell the king of Israel, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Okay, this is where they are coming from. He operated in that military intelligence. He became an advisor to kings. Elijah was more an enemy to the kings. But the Elisha dimension, the kings are calling for you. They know that, look, there's something in you that we need. There's something you are carrying that can help us. And when you enter those spheres, and then territorial domination begins to come in. And then they begin to ask, who is your God? That's when Isaiah 2 can begin to come to pass. Or is it Isaiah 4? Where he says that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall and, say, and, 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 they, and they will follow you. They can't follow you to nothingness now. Do you understand? So, that, that's the background of, of, of purpose, of ancient plans. That God is reconciling all things. To himself. So the, the story of Elisha actually started, even though we read from 2 Kings where we see how he got into the fullness of his dimension. But the story of Elisha started in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. And, and, and we see how, you know, Elijah was at the end of his, 1 Kings 19, 15. Elijah was almost at the end of his ministry. He was tired. He was burnt out. And in the midst of that, God, in a secret place, when they went to meet the Lord in the wilderness, and then God said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Elijah couldn't do this. Elisha had to do it for him. The Elisha generation is the completion generation. The things that the, the fathers could not do, the apostolic fathers, the Babalolas, the Dahosas, the things that they started but they could not accomplish, we are the generation that would accomplish it. Verse 16. Verse 16. It says, And you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. Again, Elisha fulfilled this. And 
Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Can you tell somebody that God knows your name? God knows your name. God knows your name. God knows where you live. Tell the person, God knows where you live. Because prior to now, we had never heard of Elisha before. Now, Elisha was, if we, when we get to later verses, we see that Elisha was a businessman. Yeah? We know he was a businessman. He was not a part of the sons of the prophets. He had no prophetic pedigree. Like many of us. Just went to school. You know, there's a purpose. There's a reason why God aligned your life that way. Do you understand? There's a reason why. Because, of what, because the model you are, you are coming to express is different. Okay? So, please let me go back to the scripture. And, and so we see that in, 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 in God, God identified Elisha as a successor to the ministry of Elijah. And I got said to Elijah, he says, he called him, says, says, Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He knew his family pedigree of um, wherever you are from, God knows you. Give me the next verse, please. I want to, we need to raise. I have a lot of material to cover quickly. It says, and it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. I can view the whole scripture, someone on this alone. Because it shows you that, see, the Bible says, Jesus in Revelation speaking, he said that I will destroy them with the sword of my mouth. And I, Hazael is a king, we understand. He can inflict judgment with his armies. Jehu, a king. But how come Elisha is, um, <laughs> is also listed there that? And not, not, not only listed, it's like the supreme court of God's judgment. That what the high court of Hazael could not do, and the appeal court of Jehu could not do, the supreme court of Elisha will do. The Elisha generation is, an, is a generation that is working in authority. And, and, and there's a, God is saying that there's a restoration of authority in this season. Because of, over the years, there, indeed, there was a generation in the church, in Nigeria, in the world, that when they spoke, things happened. When they spoke, they shut down cities. They shut down systems. Okay? But in this day, we seem to have lost that dimension. But God is saying that in this Elisha generation, that dimension of authority, people that will speak, okay, and what they say will be law in spheres, in mountains, in cities. That's the generation that is, that is rising up for, 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 for in, in, in this time. So, we see that just, just go down. And so, so, and so we see that after this, we see that Elisha was not involved here at all. He was on his own somewhere. Maybe he was selling meat that day to some people that came from or your state to buy. Okay? But somewhere, a plan, an ancient plan had been released that concerned him. There are things that in this season, God is already speaking concerning you. He's already giving instruction concerning you. You may, you may not have heard it. But it's coming to you. So it was that background that came to verse 19. Go back to verse 19. And where, he's, where Elijah now met Elisha and put his cloak on him and said what? It was, it was his, own, his own way of saying, follow me, right? And immediately, Elisha was busy with 12 yoke of oxen. There's a way they calculated this thing. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay? But he left it immediately. In fact, thank you. He slaughtered it. That is, just in case, maybe I follow Elijah to one place and it's like, ah, oh man, man of God, I've not seen him for two days. Wait. He, he, he killed, that, that's, that's what we read in Romans 12. A living sacrifice. He killed his options. And you see, this generation, including me, we are a people that speak so many things but achieve little. And God is saying that if you want to see my dimensions the way you saw in previous generations and even more, there must be a people of, of 100% consecration. God is looking for a 100% people. People that don't have plan Bs. People that, people that don't have one leg here and just in case we don't know how God is, in case, you know, all your visas, UK, US, Canada, in case... In case, we don't know how this thing will go. In case, trust in the Lord, but also use your sense. In case, okay, 
God is looking. So, and, and, and we just come and say, yes, the Lord will do it. He will, he will not pour that level of prophetic resource on 50, 50% people. So, so, that's what Elisha did. He left everything and followed. So, in the midst of that, and, and don't forget, the Bible says that Elisha ministered to Elijah. The, the old King James says that he poured water on his hands. You need to know who Elijah was. Elijah was a man of no pedigree. He was just a raw man. You understand? Like maybe, I'm looking for somebody who we can see is super educated in this place. Let me see. You know, the high life, you have a lot of intellectuals. Even me, I feel like an intellectual dwarf compared to some of you. The concept, you know. The places you have been to. Okay, let me see, let me see, let me see. What can I use now? I don't know. P- ah, Pastor Blessing is doing his PhD. Okay. <laughs> so, so now, imagine Pastor Blessing as he is. One man comes from um, Elisha. Let's just use Elisha. I don't know what's happening there. The guys didn't pass primary three. And when of you with this your grammar, the guy, you know, maybe he's in the church where the guy will preach in Yoruba. They will not interpret in English. You won't go to that church. Stay the truth. You say, God, there are many ways to this thing. I can come to high life. Why, why do I have to? Because by the time you're interpreting, I'm listening to two messages. The time is long. I have to go and watch uh, Man U versus Liverpool this afternoon. How long will we be in church? Okay? So, it, it took a real deep level of humility for Elisha to not only walk with Elijah. He said he was pouring water on his hand. They're an African. Think about what it means. Now. He said he wants to eat everybody. He said, Elamu Yishawa. Wash hand. That was his work. He, he didn't even see one prophecy yet. He started from washing of hand. Do you understand? But you see, there are some dimensions that the former generation have worked in. We can speak all we want today. If we do not lay hold on those dimensions, maximize it, and then build on it, it will be nothing. I'm telling you, it will be nothing. It will be nothing. So, I need to move quickly, move quickly now. It brings us to 2 Kings chapter 1, chapter 2. After all of this background, we then see that after Elijah had been called, Elisha had been called, Elisha had been chosen. In his, he wasn't there, but he was chosen. He was called and he responded. He began to follow Elijah as a disciple. Then it came to pass. A time came when it was time for Elijah to go and for the transfer to happen to Elisha. But Elijah, being a man of prophetic patterns and understanding, knew that for Elisha to qualify to carry this deposit that is coming, he needed to pass through a certain pathway. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Stand ye in the ways and see. It says, And ask for the old paths. There are some old parts. There are some old parts that the former generation, they knew. The Babalolas, the Idahosas. These guys, they knew certain things that these days we have used grace to kill those things. And I'm telling you, the more we are saying grace, the more we are unable to produce their results. Because, and the fault is not with grace. The fault is with our understanding of grace. Because the Bible specifically says in 2 Peter, it says that, it talks about grace being, the, it says the manifold grace of God, which means that grace is what? It's many-sided, it's multidimensional. The beginning of grace is where it says in, in Titus chapter 2. It says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The first work of grace is that it, it brings salvation, it appears to everybody. That's where the church has stayed. And that's where we cannot grow. Hebrews chapter 5, it begins to let us know in Hebrews 5 that there are some things that we can never enter if we don't mature. Paul, I believe he, I mean like pastor, I believe he wrote the book of Hebrews. And Paul said that, look, he says, concerning Melchizedek, okay, of whom we have much to say, but we cannot tell you because you are still dull of hearing. You are still immature. And guess what? That lets me know that there are some things that we need to know that are not in the Bible. Because he never said it anywhere else. And yet it was beneficial for those people. He said, we have much to say concerning Melchizedek. And actually, Melchizedek is the highest form of priesthood. Because even Christ, the Bible says he came in the order of Melchizedek. But those things, we couldn't find it in scriptures. The, the, the patterns of it, the dimensions of it. Because the writer was frustrated writing to a people that refused to grow. 
who chose to just lay on the altar of, um, for, of salvation, the grace that brings salvation. That's the baby level of grace. But it moves on. The next verse, Titus chapter 2, chapter 2, it says, I appear to all men. But the next thing that grace does is that it, says, it teaches us. So from the salvation angle, grace now moves to the next level of secondary school. It becomes your teacher. Teaching us what? To deny. Give me the next space. To deny ungodliness and worldly loss. And that we should live. The grace we hear these days does not have this dimension. It's always about you are forgiven. Don't worry. If your conscience tells you like this, God is greater than your conscience. Which day will we deny this? This is, this is still the work of grace. There's a dimension of grace where Paul begins to say that I labored more than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God. But we have been hearing that when we have grace, we will not need to labor again. <laughs> the Bible never teaches that. The Bible only tells us that grace would fuel your labor. Okay? That's the dimension of grace. We see another dimension of grace where Paul says that because of the manifold revelations that was given to him, he was sent a thorn in the flesh. And he beseeched God three times that God should take this away. And God said, my grace is sufficient. A grace that enables you to stay under the process. This grace does not bring deliverance. So it brings staying power. It's still a dimension of grace. These are dimensions we need to recover. For me, one of the highest forms of grace is Hebrews chapter 12. I think verse 22. If I'm not mistaken. He says, um, Holy Ghost, help me. Hebrews 12. He says, seeing that we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You can see kingdom there again. That means that this kingdom of God, its ways are not movable. It will not shift for you. You have to shift for it. Okay, says, seeing that we have a kingdom, verse 28, thank you. Seeing that we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us do what? Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably. With reverence and God live here. Verse 29. This part is in New Testament. Too. Look at it. 29, give it to me. For our God is still, me, I'm adding it, is still a consuming fire. That means his order, the way to serve him. God did not, because of New Testament, he didn't start saying, okay, I used to hate sin in New Testament. I would like it now because of grace. No. He's just saying that he's the same God. The God of, the, the God that gave Moses the law. Even though the law changed because of the new priesthood. But he's the same God. His character has not changed. The way to serve him in terms of godliness, holiness, and godly fear, it has not changed. But there's a grace that gives us the ability to align, to serve him in that way. Do you understand? So, so that, that's, why, that's why we are weak. Plus me. Come to I'm saying things that I cannot see in my life. Okay? So, but when we look at Elisha, and Elijah, I asked for your permission. We're going to close late. Okay? <laughs> Thanks, I receive it. <laughs> now, when we look at Elisha, Elijah, Elijah, go back to 2 Kings chapter 2. We see that there's a pathway. Jeremiah 6.16 6, says, ask for the old parts. There's a pathway that the ancients, the likes of William Seymour, they didn't just discover speaking in tongues. They fought for these things. These things that you are enjoying today. Okay? People were excommunicated from the church because of it. Do you understand? Healing. You would think that, ah, how hard is it for you to believe that God can heal? People were sacked from churches because they were preaching that God could heal the sick. You, you, you just came into the gospel. You are enjoying this thing today. Well, people paid sacrifices. Catherine Kuhlman, you know how many times she was taken to court? Because she was healing people. They accused her of practicing medicine without a license. Smith Wiggles what? These guys, they went, through, they went through hell in their personal lives just to establish, you know, and reclaim the truths that we take for granted today. So there's a pathway. These guys, they didn't just wake up after four wraps of Eba and, 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 and three meat and two chicken and said, it's good to start healing the sick. Let's go. They, 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 they engaged. They followed a the pathway that enable them to lay hold on certain things. But we choose to talk until we revisit their pathways. See, the things we will produce may be different from theirs. 
But the path to getting there is an ancient path. It cannot change for you. It's the same across all generations. Okay? So, 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's move quickly. It says that, give me verse 2. And it says that, that Elijah, let's go back to verse 1, sorry, sir. Elijah, Elijah, Elijah was at Bethel with, with Elijah. So there was a progression. I, I'm wondering, look, Elijah, this guy has saved you. We don't know the number of you, but he has saved you for some time. Now you want to go. Is his service not enough for you to just release this thing to him? These fairs are waiting now. The, the, the woman with, with that, that didn't have a child, she's waiting for Elisha to come and bring, you know, bring the deliverance. Naaman is waiting. The systems are waiting. But Elijah had to take Elisha through a pathway. And that's the pathway that God is taking every generation through. And when you come through this pathway, at the end of this pathway, the power, the authority, the new dimensions of glory is waiting for us there. There, there are concepts in banking. Okay? There are people that are going to rise up in the church that will shatter the current structures of finance and economy. It's coming. They will get concepts from the spirit world, from the spirit realm, and produce it on the earth. And men will come to learn. There are people that are going to... See, if you look at... I like to study history. If, 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 it's, it's the Western civilization that actually brought some sort of dichotomy between the spiritual and the physical. In older civilizations, there was no difference. If you look at ancient Egypt, right? The king of Egypt was also the high priest of Egypt. So he was fulfilling... You know what priesthood is? Priesthood is the person who is standing between the invisible realm and the visible realm. Okay? So, so ancient civilizations, they understood these things. They understood it. There, there was a guy called Imhotep. You can Google it. I-M-H-O-T-E-P. He was one of the strong priests of Egypt. But he was, he, in reality, doctors actually say that, you know, this, like they say, it is um, the, it's the strong that write the history, right? That Imhotep was actually the father of modern medicine, not Hippocrates. Okay? But Imhotep was somebody who, without shame, he downloaded cures from the realm of the spirit. Of course, not using the spirit of God. Okay? He downloaded cures. There's, there, 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 are, there are cures. I'm not talking of coming here and we are laying hands on you to be healed. That dimension, would ex it will explode, yes. But there are people who are going to take science. Okay? Not that they read it in a book. Hmm? They will be at home. They would wake up in the morning. Angels have downloaded genetic pathways into their spirit. And then they will come out and explain it in language that people can understand. People are going to be able to live longer. Because, because the world is, is, is delving into that dimension of research. Okay? And they may not tell you, but the truth is that many of these things, and go, go to Genesis, the ideas came from the realm of the spirit. But we have, a, we have, Bible says that we have received the spirit of God and not the spirit of the world. So, this is the pathway. The first place that Elijah started from was Gilgal. And everybody who wants to walk in this coming glory dimension, this generation of Elisha, including myself, we must start from Gilgal. What is, what is Gilgal? I just called the scriptures and it's immediately I can just show it. I, I won't have time to read it. Okay? In Genesis, Joshua chapter 5 from verse 1 to 9, emphasis on verse 9, we see that when the children of Israel were about to enter the promised land, um, God gave Joshua an instruction. He said that some of these guys, because they were born in the wilderness, they did not understand the covenants that God had with the people. So he said, look, before they go into inheritance, they must be circumcised. So they took knives to circumcise adult men. That thing was painful, man. Do you understand? But it was a cutting of the flesh. That's what yoga stands for. It was a cutting of the flesh. That's what, that's what it was. And it talks about dealings. Because it says that, it says that God said that, that in verse 9, it says that this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. See, when you came into Christ, you came in with your baggage. There are some things that you came into Christ with from the world. Right? You are in Christ already. But to enter this Elisha generation, it has to be cut off. So some of you did dealing. Some of you is pride. Your family name. 
can open doors. My own cannot even open window. Okay? But your own, it has been opening doors. And then all of a sudden, God has, the doors are no more opening. You call your father's name, they say, so what? Okay? And you think that they've come for you. You come to church, Pastor Blessing. I need more favor. Keep, you will pray. Nothing will still work. Because there's a bigger dealing that is happening. Your flesh has to die. Think about it. For some of us, like women, lost. For some of us, it's anger. For some of us, whatever it is, your flesh, the things that you have put your strength in, the things that has the capacity to hinder you. Look at Elisha. As you mean, he was, his flesh was not dealt with. I hope you know there was a time that he, he was in the house of a woman. They built a house for him upstairs. And the woman was young. How do I know? Because when she couldn't give birth, they didn't say she was old. They said her husband was old. So she was a young woman. Maybe probably fine. Unless she didn't have a wife. If his flesh had not been dealt with, we may have heard how the prophet impregnated the woman and they put it on, on the old man. Okay? Flesh, it has, to, it has to die. It has to die. So some of us, it, it is a pathway that God is taking us through to kill the things that can stop you from laying hold on authority, glory, and power. But some of us, we are running away from it. You think it's the devil. No, sir, it's God that is doing it. This pain that you are going through, is God, God is the sponsor. Who, who drove Jesus into the wilderness? The Bible says, and the spirit drove him. That means he didn't want to go. He drove him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The spirit drove him. Some of us, the spirit is driving you to places you don't want to go. It's not because the spirit hates you now and he loves you before. No, it's because of what is coming. There's a glory coming. So, Gilgal is the first place. The second place that they went to, go back to Second Kings, was he took him from Gilgal and he said, let's go to Jericho. Jericho, as you know, is a place of spiritual warfare. It's a place where, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, it says, by faith, the wall of Jericho fell. Sorry, before, before Jericho, there's Bethel. Bethel, let's go to Bethel. Bethel is important. Bethel is what? The house of God. When we look at Genesis chapter 28, you know, from 11 to 19, we know that Bethel is the place where I, and what's his name? Jacob met with God. The Bible says he, he put his head on a, on a pillow and then he had a dream and he saw angelic activity, them going up and down. It's a place of the presence of God. It's a place of encounters. Now, that is, that is, that is Jacob. But in Genesis chapter 13 or Genesis chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, we also see that Abraham, his father, was, his grandfather was in that same Bethel. And Bible says, and he built an altar there. To the Lord. And we see maybe other chapters in Genesis where God now tells Jacob, he says, go back to Bethel. Bethel is the house of God. That's what it means. Beth in Hebrew means house. El is God. Okay? So, it's a skill. The place of Bethel is a place where people learn how to stay in the presence of God. How to build altars. How to fellowship. With God. It's a lost art these days. Jesus himself said, my house Shall we call what? The house of prayer. Let me tell you. Yes, it is true that when you received the Holy Ghost, you had immeasurable power locked up on the inside of you. The problem is that the power is like your generator, right? The generator has the ability to give you light. But it has to be what? Switched on. Bible says in um, James chapter 5 verse 16, it says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous. One version says, makes much power available. Some of us are trying to distribute power that we have not yet generated. It can't work. The power is in you, yes, but you generate it in the presence. When we read about how the likes of Babalola, see, if you want to learn prayer, <laughs> go and rediscover CSC people. They may not know the scriptures like you, but this book can stay one place. Staying power 12 hours. And when they speak, you see, I'm a student of Christian history. I've read stories of Allah where the, the gap between the natural and the spiritual didn't exist for him. Do you understand? 
he could, angels, he could send them. They, they cooked for him. Sometimes. They did. Okay, the kind of power, the kind of authority that he carried, he could determine the fate of systems. Do you understand? He Daosa, those were men that, that they understood prayer. You cannot enter this dimension with your prayer in the bathroom. Oh, Jesus, thank you. I love you. Amen. Help me, help me. Show me the, the best part in this traffic. So that I can, amen. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Bye. <laughs> it cannot produce nothing. I'm telling you. That you don't understand what is coming. We are talking of a glory dimension. You want to carry God. When you step into a place, when you speak, the, the, the climate will change. The Bible is talking about this, giving us the power to raise the dead. It will not come. It will not come from those dimensions of prayer. We have to rediscover it. We may know more Hebrew and Greek than the fathers, but in the place where it matters, they knew how to generate this power. They knew how to shut things down, go into the secret place, six hours. They were praying, and when they come out and they say and they speak, whole cities changed. When they spoke, and it doesn't matter what you carried, when they speak, you will fall. If you like carry 12 jujus, it, 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 couldn't, it couldn't stand you. But some of us these days, you get to the office, they put something on your chair, you run to church. You cannot face anything because you have not generated power. I have not, it's me too. I have not generated power. There's something coming. There's a dimension of wisdom that God wants to show. The systems of the world must bow to the name of Jesus. They must see a certain wisdom and it cannot come except we begin to pray. We become a people of the house of God. Secret place activations. Understanding of encounters. Understanding of systems of God. From Bethel, he moved to Jericho. My time is gone. And I know that you are still dealing with the flesh. You may, you may not forgive me so much. Let me move quickly. Jericho, the place of warfare. Some of us have not learned how to fight. Bible says, that thanks be that is God that teaches my fingers to fight and my to prepare my hand for battle and my fingers to fight. Jericho is also a place of faith. Do we still have faith? It was the question that Jesus asked when the son of man returns, shall he find faith in the earth? A dimension of faith. It's like the more knowledge we have of external things, the less we're able to trust God. Do you know what it means to the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 30, it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. You know what it means to receive instruction from God? And God says, just keep quiet. Go around. Okay, you are seeing this wall. This wall of, so because, because there's a, there are two dimensions of faith. But in this season, I see God releasing the higher dimension, which is the faith of God. There's faith in God. Okay? Which is what we have, and we place it in God. But there's faith of God. This is the faith that God has in himself. Do you understand? The faith of God. And in this dimension, I, I don't take my word for it. Go and listen to prophecies by people like, um, I can't remember the name of this man now. He's late. Okay, but he prophesied that in this season that we're in, and this, this prophecy gave like in the 80s, but everything is said in terms of times and seasons that's happened. Okay? But he said that in this season, that there's going to be a strong activation of the faith of God. People are going to have faith to do insane things. People are going to hospitals and empty mortuaries. He said that. It's going to happen. It is you that God is waiting for. In every generation, David said that. The Bible says in Acts that, and after David had served God in his generation. So the plan of God will not change, but the generation may change. If this generation is not ready, God's plan is, God is ever patient. The Bible says he's long-suffering. He waits. He's, he was patient enough to allow one generation to die in the wilderness. We will not be that generation. We will be the generation that would lay hold on, on the things he has said. I need to move very fast. So Jericho is a place of faith. Have you learned how to trust God? Have you learned how to believe God for anything? Have you learned how to believe God for the impossible? The wall of Jericho was impregnable. Okay? But by faith, it fell. And then lastly, he moved him to Jordan. And Jordan is a place of baptism, death, burial, and resurrection. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 talks about how if we've been baptized into Christ, then as the father raised him up, 
through the glo- as he was raised up by the glory of the Father, so also we shall be raised up into newness of life. Have you learned the operations of the power of God? Have you understood it in his workings, in his dimensions? But it comes to a people who are ready to die in him and to be raised up anew. So we end with Romans 12. In view of all of these things, what sort of lives do we have to live? It says, therefore I beseech you that you present yourselves a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. You can, you can be a billionaire without being a living sacrifice. But God, God didn't send Jesus. The plan of God, there's no way. You may be. For you, it may be your plan. But generally, there's no way we are promised that if we follow Jesus, we'll all have houses in Banana Island. Even though me too, I want to have. But it wasn't promised to us. But the promise was for more tangible things. The Bible calls these things true riches. Where you have power with God. You can, you can from Nigeria, speak into spheres, and those spheres will turn. Where God is, is calling you and saying, look, my friend, I'm giving you the financial sector. Express my wisdom in that sector. New concepts are being released to you. Where God is saying, I'm giving you the, the health sector. Express my wisdom. Where God is saying, I'm giving you the family sector. Reverse corruption. Where God is saying, I'm giving you media. Where God is saying, I'm giving you entertainment. Where God is saying, I'm giving you technology. And he's downloading ideas from the spirit. You are able to bring new concepts into the earth through the operations of the Holy Ghost. It will not come at our current level of sacrifice. We are, going to, we are not going to sacrifice things. We are going to sacrifice ourselves. We are going to lay our lives down and say to him, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Not all of you, not all of us would have to leave our business like Elisha. But you have to leave something because of this call, because of this ancient plan that is bigger than you and bigger than me. The nations are waiting. The people that you have been called to are waiting. Nigeria is waiting. waiting. You know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll begin to pray in a bit, but as I was preparing for this, the, the, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and was downloading some things to me and was saying that there are some people here that East Africa is waiting for you. I don't know who those people are or that person is. But he says, East Africa is waiting for you. And it's a few that he has given to, to whoever that person is. You may know currently or you may not even know. But for you to enter that level of dimension, when you go and dominate that sphere, you will need to, you will need to elevate the level of your sacrifice. Let, let's, let's stand up on our feet. High life, we advance.